today. So thank you all again for joining us. Some of you may have joined us for an icon earlier in the year where we explored aspects of nutrition as it relates to cancer care. Um, we did attach a white paper to this session. So if you've had a chance to look at it, you might be familiar with some of the solutions that surfaced in those conversations. Today, we are taking it a step further. Our goal is for this session, our goal for this session is to narrow down what a potential Livestrong investment can solve in this area. What should be a part of the solution, what shouldn't, and how can it be implemented? Ultimately, your input, input from today will help inform our funding decisions for 2022 solution grants, which is super exciting. So to lead us in this discussion is not me. Um, instead, you have somebody far more qualified. This is Jean Lamantia. She's a registered dietitian, cancer survivor, and she's the author of three books, The Complete Lymphedema Management and Nutrition Guide, The Essential Cancer Treatment Nutrition Guide and Cookbook, and Complete Intermittent. She is also the creator of the Cancer Risk Reduction Guide to help cancer survivors reduce the risk of recurrence. She lives in Toronto, Canada where she has a virtual private practice. Jean, the gallery is all yours. Oh, thank you, Suzanne. And I'm really thrilled to be invited. And, you know, I love to speak about nutrition and cancer, but when Suzanne said, we're gonna try and find, we're, we're gonna find a problem and we're gonna solve that problem. That's what really hooked me and really got me excited about this. And when Suzanne said, well, you know, this is about cancer nutrition, automatically, this is where my mind goes. And I think it's partly as a nutrition professional, but also because I've been through this process, immediately I come up with these sort of three boxes. And maybe we can show the slide, Suzanne, and people will know what I'm talking about. And what I always think about when it comes to cancer nutrition is I think of in treatment, what are the in treatment issues? And that's that whole alphabet of stuff, right? Low appetite, anemia, taste changes, aversions, weight loss, weight gain, diarrhea, constipation, vomiting, like that whole list. And as a registered dietitian, my approach there is, okay, how do I help people solve these problems with nutrition? How do we use nutrition to minimize, even if nutrition is not the source of the problem, how do we solve that problem? And so I'll let you, okay, so this is, yeah. So this is that first bullet that I'm talking about, the nutrition related side effects. Also, it could be the cancer itself. So for example, if you've got prostate cancer or colon cancer, there's a mass that's pressing on your colon and maybe you can't, maybe you're at risk of a bowel obstruction. So in that case, it's the cancer itself. Sometimes it's the treatment. Are you getting those side effects from your chemotherapy, from the radiation? Like, do you have all your salivary glands dried up and you have no moisture in your mouth? So that's one category I think of. Then there's also the sort of the post-treatment issues. And some of these are just in-treatment issues that persist for a while. And some of them can really start after treatments even long gone, but things like lymphedema, neuropathy. So for example, you might think, well, neuropathy, how is that a nutrition issue? Well, if I have neuropathy in my hands, how can I chop my vegetables safely? Or how can I, if I have neuropathy in my feet, how can I stand in the kitchen to prepare my meals? Um, if I have GI upset, so radiation enteritis, for example. So I had radiation to cure, you know, let's say cancer in the, in the colon or the endometrium or something. But now because my intestines were in that radiation field, now there's some scarring there. Now I don't digest my food the same way. Or chemo brain. What if I just, I can't follow a recipe with more than five ingredients because I'm just or, you know, making up a grocery list, I forget things or, so these all will have an impact on your nutrition. And lymphedema, if you're not familiar with that, is a swelling condition. And up to about 30, depending on the type of cancer, like breast cancer and melanoma, it could be 
up to upwards of 35% of people end up with lymphedema, which for example, if it's in your arm, again, that's going to affect your ability to shop for groceries, buy groceries, chop the food, your stamina. And also there are foods that will flare up that lymphedema. So that's kind of the second picture. And then the third picture, and this is the one I find most people think about if they think of cancer nutrition, that focus on how do I prevent cancer from coming back? Or if I'm living with metastatic disease, how do I keep that metastatic disease from spreading and, and keep it under control? So I've divided, I'm sharing this with you because this is just how my mind works. Those three sort of buckets, the in-treatment issues, the post-treatment issues, and I've kind of borrowed that term from the COVID, the long haul, right? Because some of these can just be chronic conditions and then those risk reductions. And then Suzanne and I um, went a little further and said, well, what are some of the issues, specific issues that we would like to narrow down? So I gave her a bigger list and then she narrowed it down some more and we've divided in these categories. So blood related issues, is there anemia because of your treatment or is there leukocytopenia so that's a fancy word for are your white blood cells low because of your chemotherapy or your radiation is there just systemic inflammation um, how's your just overall well-being is there a lot of fatigue are there eating related issues so loss of appetite early satiety food aversions nausea dysphagia which means difficulty swallowing are there taste changes where food just doesn't taste right it's you either amplify a certain flavor note, like everything tastes bitter, or you can't taste sweet anymore, or, or it's just a muted across the board, all the flavors are muted. Or is it more of a total body issue, blood sugar elevations, lymphedema, malnutrition, neuropathy, sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is a muscle wasting. And it is one of the strongest indicators of your survival during cancer treatment. If you lose your muscle mass during treatment, that has a huge impact. Um, is there weight gain? And you know, people often think of the person who has a lot of weight loss during treatment, but treatments particularly around breast cancer can actually lead to weight gain. And then of course, there's the traditional picture of that weight loss, that really, uh, that person who's very cachectic and wasted and weak. So what we thought we would do is decide of these categories and of these problems, which one do we want to solve? So as Suzanne mentioned, they will be giving out a solution grant. And I just love this idea. And now, I'd like you to vote, or maybe we could have some discussion first before we vote. Suzanne, does that sound like a good idea? So just what are your overall impressions of these issues? Have we, have we got some that you maybe had in mind that, yeah, this is a problem I really want to discuss or I really want to solve? So just would love to hear from you. Leanna, I'm going to totally call on you. What do you see most often? There we go. Sorry about that. Um, you know, I feel like on, on my end, we do a lot of work on prevention, of course. And so we are trying to help um, focus on the third bucket. But I think when it comes to all those questions about in, in, um, inpatient, outpatient treatment, um, helping people understand that there are ways through it um, that are, in a way, I think it's a mindset thing. It's like, well, how can I spend all this time or effort working on one thing when I'm just, uh, you know, trying to make it through every day? So to me, I think it's, it's a bit of the psychology of food, bringing in the, the personal side, and then helping people to see that long-term vision of like, what to do beyond um, 
that that will help them in the day to day. I think I think um, I don't know. I'll stop and let others chime in, and then I'll I'll add more later. Lindsay, I know you see people every day and and help them on their kind of nutrition journey. What is the what is your impression with that that time having you know having to spend time? Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, having to spend time in cooking, you mean? Yes, I think um, I think that is just a major issue, just given in in today's society. Anyways, I think that really like is a problem for um, a lot of people. And um, I think that on the go sort of foods have um, have not been super um, healthy or nourishing or even, you know, taste good, or it takes a while to find the right taste. So, you know, so trying to cook at home to not only make healthier options to help solve some of these um, problems is also, it's very time consuming. And when you do, you know, um, mention that the, the chemo brain and all of these other aspects to it, that also takes longer for you to, you know, cook at home. And, um, so I think that, um, all of these things, it, it's hard to, for nutrition as a whole, it's such a big beast that I feel like it's really hard to attack one thing because it's almost like everything is super holistic. And so you kind of have to start at maybe like the easier baby steps first, but then everything else seems to be very like intuitive and, and also like it, it just bounces, you know, if, if you need some if you're feeling tired or fatigued or something, then you won't have, you won't feel like you have time to cook or to make time to, to cook. And so kind of all of these things like are always connected. Um, so I guess, you know, just trying to find also a solution to make maybe quicker meals that are a little bit more on the go that don't, um, that, that involve more nourishing and more in-depth um, nutrients. Mm -hmm. Dave, I would love for you to share this thought of um, Dave works is um, if you were in Greg's session, he mentioned the cancer market network. Dave is a part of that design team um, that we're working on. And I think it would be interesting for you to share that idea of um, that we were actually talking about yesterday around taking something off the plate before adding something. Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, so the whole idea there is, uh, and the plate is, is just a metaphor. So the, the idea is what we want to do for people is simplify things before we add something that sort of adds a level of complexity, but in the end will be good for them. You know, everything we want to do for people is, is good. Some of them actually decrease their load. Like, you don't have to cut up like if cutting is hard find someone in your family who can just do that like offload that um but uh creating uh um learning a huge amount about your new uh situation and understanding it uh the complexity of something might take take more time so you want to free someone up of time before you give them something that will will require more time so that's the idea um uh so quick win that decreases the person's load of what they're carrying before you give them something else that might require a little bit of expertise so what was interesting i thought uh gene the, the way you presented those three buckets um this idea of there's complexity to your cancer, your physiological needs around nutrition, around like the food that goes in and gets broken up. And to me, and then there's this physical thing, like just preparing the food uh, is hard to do. If, if you can offload that part to someone else, then at least you, you're only trying to figure out like what food makes sense to put into my body to help me. So like, those two things I think are really great as a mental model. Like it's gonna be hard to do. 
And if you can find someone else, anyone else that will do those parts that are hard for you, do it. And because, um, uh, you, you know, those can be separated. And I think it's, it's, it's good that you separate those two. And then, of course, um, prevention is, is, is physiological, um, but it's about the future. I think that pe what people have trouble with is um, a decision tree to figure out, like, what the heck do I need? You know, I'm nauseous, but no one's talking to me about, like, the solutions there. And I don't realize that it's connected to my constipation or I don't real like, so um, it's great when there's a nutritionist who can have this conversation with you, hear your story, and then there you're doing the decision tree in your head. Can we automate that? a bit so that a, it's more accessible to people. It's just like, I got a, something's not right with my eating. What's, what, what are your symptoms? What do you feel? Do, 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 you know, have you tried this? Does this ring any bells? Oh, try this, then this, then this, then come back and put in the information. Like a good decision tree will hopefully simplify a person's journey towards what might make sense to put into their bodies. I love that you mentioned nausea because that's how specific we want to get today. We want to get to that problem and we're going to vote on it soon. What do we want to focus on? So for example, if it is nausea, what is the solution? And we're going to brainstorm what that would look like. How do we help someone with their nausea when they're in the middle of treatment? Hmm. And yeah, that's, that's a perfect example of what we want to finish up with in 90 minutes here. Um, so maybe we can all share that screen again and just look at those things and take a moment to decide. And you can think about it however you want. What would be a fun problem to solve? Or what, not that the problem is fun, but what would you have fun solving? Um, or what ha would have the most impact? Um, what was more significant for you or for the person that you cared for? Or what do you see the most? So ultimately, what problem do you want Live Strong to help solve for the cancer survivor? So if you've seen that list and if you have any questions about any of them, let me know. Because think, we're gonna, mm -hmm. I think I would um, I would focus on inflammation as something very like it's a broad thing that is obviously coming up in a certain way in blood markers, um, but it is interrelated with everything else here. Um, I think, I think we often see you know different parts of the body's expression of a challenge in many discrete ways, but the interconnectivity is actually really key, and so. Um, for the, for in the moment, nausea may be, there may be great strategies for that, but I think that there's a longer term arc of strategy that can be addressed with inflammation. And that would be, you know, making sure that there's as anti-inflammatory a diet as possible. And that if you're going to be, um, you know, using some kind of liquid foods in order to help digest easier due to issues with um, you know, in the bowels or issue with even nausea, just trying to get through, get some basic nutrition in, in spite of all of the other things going on, focusing on, um, you know, the, the most nutrient dense foods as a way of fighting that inflammation. So, you know, greens and, and, and mushrooms are incredible for, for cancer. And I think if we can narrow in on, um, certain cancer fighting foods and then how to prepare them in ways that are both simple and digestible for somebody who's going through treatment and experiencing um, a wide variety of symptoms. Um, it may be menus or um, uh, some kind of meal planning tool that people can use who are um, at different stages of treatment. But at the core is this theme of anti-inflammatory eating. Okay, so we have one vote for inflammation. That's excellent. And you're already, we're starting to think about solutions too. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. That's how we, you know, I can see the creative juices are flowing already. All right, any other um, 
input of what problem we want to focus on in our group here. Dave? Yeah. What's the most common, what's just the most common uh, complaint that, that people hear? And I would be, say yeah. appetite, low appetite is pretty across the board. Low appetite. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's one I think is pretty universal. Like, you know, if I think of, you know, in terms of nutrition, like there's certain cancers that are incredibly impacted. Like if you think of head and neck cancer, so someone has cancer in their pharynx or larynx or tongue, like they're pretty much going to need a tube feeding. They can't get through treatment without it because they'll get to a point where they just can't get anything in. And that's sort of the extreme example to someone with, let's say maybe prostate cancer undergoing radiation where the treatment is not really that invasive, but you know, they can be sort of low energy and maybe their appetite's off a bit or, you know, similar to like a breast cancer. Like I, I find like appetite seems to go that entire spectrum. How appetizing is um, anti-inflammatory food? You know, how appetizing is anything if you're nauseated and have a low appetite? Like, just think of the last time you had the flu or were sick. Is anything, you know, it's, it's going to taint anything. So, and that's the challenge sometimes you're, you know, as a dietitian, that's what I'm dealing with is how do I keep somebody's nutrition up when they're just like, they can't, they can't even face food. And that's why. For me, I, I really use those three buckets because I don't want to talk to someone about this is your healthy plant-based diet and this is what you need to do when they're in the middle of treatment because I feel from my perspective, that just adds more pressure. It adds guilt. It adds um, this layer of anxiety. Like, oh my God, I'm eating this white bread and I shouldn't be eating that because that's not good. And honestly, I really try and relieve them of all that pressure and stress. And a lot of my approach is just get through it. Just get through this treatment the best way you can. And when you're feeling better, that's when we're going to talk about risk reduction and plant-based diet and all of that other stuff. Um, so I really try, uh, I'm a big believer in all of that, but I, I try to introduce that in a way that doesn't create more stress and anxiety for my client. So I yeah. have, um, I think, I guess I can second vote um, inflammation. Um, okay. I think that like between inflammation and malnourishment, um, inflammation is, I believe in the, in the wellness world, a real, um, the issue of so many things of autoimmune inflammation of the gut and our gut is technically our second brain that's where a lot of our health is um and so if we are inflamed we are not receiving any nutrients um so so there are there's no communication in our body that is giving what, what where we need the nutrients the most um so i do think a very in-depth anti-inflammatory um sort of at least like food plan is really is is one of the major priorities in, in this um and so once the inflammation goes down more then your body can communicate and and talk and produce hormones that are needed such as you know the appetite hormone and and all these things just start like funneling together um then maybe you know you do have the appetite right and then all of a sudden you're eating more protein and then you're able to stabilize your weight and so I think that everything starts with the inflammation and, and for, for specifically as it relates to the, to the gut um, and then how it communicates between fatigue and nausea. And um, again, all of these things that I just think are so holistic, um, but inflammation is definitely one of my vote for sure. As I you know, talk to a lot of people about their nutrition, inflammation is just the number one cause of, of, of so many things that I feel like always starting out at a very basic 
um, diet or nutrition plan is how you how you can kind of get things to to come back to normalcy a little bit to like homeostasis, and then um, and then introduce different foods. Um, so I feel like again I'll, I'll second that vote for inflammation. All right. And Man. Nadia, would you like oh, sorry. to give? Oh, sorry, Karen. That's Suzanne. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. That's Liana. Go ahead, Liana. Um, do you mind if I just respond to one thing? And Nadia, I've, I'm sorry to jump in here, but um, I've been thinking a bit about context. And I think one of the most, one of the things that I believe strongly in is that we often segment treatment and food as two completely different things. So treatment is what the doctors recommend and food is this sort of nice extra thing on the side. And I really think that if we're going to make any headway on cancer outcomes, that treatment and nutrition have to go hand in hand and that food is, food is part of the treatment. So my personal bent, of course, would be to say, how can we get more healthcare professionals aware of food as medicine? and have that be the first line of defense, only after which we layer in more traditional cancer treatment um, so that we can start to heal the body first with food and take care of whatever else is left over with medicine. And um, that's radical. I know it's not commonly accepted, but I think it's really tremendous and it is a completely different paradigm that we're, than what we're living in right now. And the other thing is that I think when people feel hopeless, I remember when my mother was in the situation that just the, the drain of the energy in my home around our inability to control things. What I found now in doing cancer, cancer nutrition education in communities is that people find hope in, in the process of nourishing themselves with food that they know will be anti-cancer even if they're not going to totally overcome their cancer just with food, that act of, of loving oneself through food preparation is actually really powerful. And I think it gives people a sense of control even when there isn't a lot of control to be had. So as much as I wanna acknowledge the challenges that people might have in preparing meals or whatever, I think there's a, a rekindling of connection and love between people and the nourishment process and the particular foods that, that will love us and, and reduce inflammation that um, can help us to speak with enthusiasm about the, um, you know, where to go with nutrition and how um, we don't have to feel like it's as much of a burden as it is a huge part of the treatment process. That's beautiful. And I definitely relate to that control piece, like myself, when I was going through my treatment, absolutely, that's so important. And food. Yeah, it's one of those acts of, it's one of the love languages, right? You know, preparing food that's, that's so key to nurturing. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. And um, Nadia, do you have an idea of what problem you'd like to solve here? You're on mute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, after hearing everybody speak, I, I also agree about the inflammation because the inflammation is like an underlying factor that affects so many other body systems. So if we could address that underlying issue, um, that would be a great place to start. However, I know like changing a diet, I mean, it can be very overwhelming. Like, what do you eat? Where do I begin? Um, I feel like simplifying the, you know, the diet as much as possible, for example, possibly giving like, just starting out with one healthy meal or one healthy snack into the diet and get that consistent, or maybe just pick one meal and that really work on making that meal very healthy. Um, and then adding on from there, just simplifying the process. Or if you have trouble cutting up vegetables, perhaps purchasing cut up vegetables or um, adaptive um, knives that can help the process just to take away one layer of challenge or difficulty um, and make the process simpler. So those are some ideas. All right, Suzanne, it looks like we have three votes here for inflammation. So all right, so let's solve this problem of inflammation. Now, 
I think what we have to keep in mind, and Suzanne, you can correct me, is we're looking for like part of this process um, is Suzanne, well, why don't you explain it, you know, about the RFP and actually, because we want to kind of direct our energy into something that Love Strong can solve, right? Absolutely. So um, I think almost everybody here has been on a call before and um, and Leanna is actually a recipient of a Live Strong grant um, at Plant Powered Metro New York, which is so fantastic. And um, so the purpose of today is to help narrow. One of the things that we've seen, right, is that um, our grant applications have been fairly broad in scope and just said, all right, tell us in general what you're going to solve. And the purpose of ICON has been to try to narrow this down and really understand where that, um, where the most friction is happening and also where the appetite is a pun, I guess, right? But the appetite of the cancer community, what is happening um, and how do we stay ahead of things? What can we solve? Nutrition is something that just keeps coming back over and over and over again. So the purpose of today is we're going to, I would love to come up with with actual specifics around what we'll be able to put in an RFP in 2022 that says, not only are we just looking for nutrition solutions, we're looking for a solution to inflammation. These are the things that should be on the list, right? This is what that solution should encompass. This is not, not prescribing what the solution looks like exactly, but instead what it should achieve. Does that make sense? So that's where we really would love your input today and, and guidance, because I don't want to leave anything out. Um, you know, should we focus on the food or should we focus on the utensils? Like it could be that specific, right? Should we focus on food delivery systems or integration into clinics? Like what is the, what is the thing? And so that's, that's where Jean is more expert than me, but that's, does that answer the question? I think does that make sense to everybody. We want to give somebody money to solve this problem that we're going to talk about today. And so I'd like to just give a little bit of background just so we're all on the same page. So when we're talking about inflammation, we're talking about cellular inflammation. And it's, I think of it as an environment inside the body. And let's say you have an injury of some type. <clears throat> you have a sunburn or you have... Uh, a virus like human papilloma virus or HIV virus or Epstein-Barr or something, something in your body that basically calls cellular 911. It says, send the inflammatory cells to this area. We've got an issue. And here they come. They come to that area. And in a normal, healthy situation, those inflammatory cells come and they solve the problem and they go away. But what can happen in a chronic inflammatory situation is that they stay in that area and then it creates an area of inflammation. It creates this micro environment. And unfortunately, that micro environment of inflammation is something that encourages cancer cells to just come into being in the first place and then can encourage their growth uh, and their spread. Um, so if, I'll give you myself, for example, when I was 17, I had a really bad sunburn right here on my chest. And it was the same area 10 years later where I had the massive uh, tumor. And so I don't know for sure, but I can imagine that, you know, my body called cellular 911 for that initial injury. But because of certain things in my environment, that inflammation persisted. All right. And we have some ideas why acute healthy inflammation becomes chronic unhealthy inflammation. And some of it is diet. Uh, some of it is the amount of fat and where you carry your fat in your body. Some of it is the air that you breathe. Um, stress, lack of exercise. These can all make healthy short term inflammation into chronic unhealthy inflammation. The other piece of the puzzle that we know is that we can measure the amount of inflammation in our blood. There are certain blood markers that we can measure. And we also know, and this has been validated in the research, that diet can reduce those blood levels of inflammation. All right. 
And the diet that's been shown to reduce that is a plant-based diet. It's that traditional Mediterranean diet. It's a diet where food is whole, not processed. Uh, food is low glycemic. There's lots of